This week's sermon with Jim Nave at Fiddletown Church. See, one of the, the most controversial things in, in, in the Bible and in the body of Christ is how do you receive from God? I'm not sure you've thought much about that, but there are two very conflicting views in the body of Christ regarding how a person is designed to receive from God. The predominant one is that God is in control, therefore he chooses if, when, where, and how a person receives from him. So we're going to continue to talk about the weapons of our warfare. And today I'm going to talk about the weapon of acting on God's promises. See, one of the, the most controversial things in, in, in the Bible and in the body of Christ is how do you receive from God? I'm not sure you've thought much about that. But there are two very conflicting views in the body of Christ regarding how a person is designed to receive from God. The predominant one is that God is in control, therefore he chooses if, when, where, and how a person receives from him. And they've taken the word sovereignty that means all-powerful, and they've changed it to mean control. And now he determines everything, and we ask, and we just wait. Or the other theological belief is that we have a free will, therefore we have to choose, right? So we have to believe and exercise faith to receive from him. Well, can we agree those are two distinct, different ways to receive? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what the Bible says. That'd be like unique, right? Let's look at what the scripture says, right? So we're going to look at the story of the, of the Passover or the Exodus story because this is the picture of, of God's people being taken out of darkness, being placed into the light, right? This is a prophetic picture of salvation. That's what the Exodus story is. It's a prophetic picture of what all of us who believe in Jesus receive, so what I want to do is I want to kind of lay the foundation here and I want us to, to understand. So, so Egypt represents living in the kingdom of darkness, right? That's where everyone who is not born again yet is living. So Egypt represents living in the kingdom of darkness. Pharaoh represents Satan, the small g God of this world. Moses represents Jesus, the deliverer. And the promised land represents the kingdom of God or the kingdom of light, not in heaven, on earth. On earth as it is in heaven, right? That's what Jesus said. I came to make heaven come down to earth so you can experience here and not have to wait till you die to experience me. So our promise, one of the many is first. Uh, excuse me, Colossians 1.13, it says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Right? So that's a promise. It's very similar. And this is what we see in the Exodus story. So what I want us to do is kind of walk through what, what God was doing with the children of Israel because it's the same thing he wants to do for us. If you read in the book of 1 Corinthians, it says to learn from them. And he's talking about the children of Israel. He says to learn from them. There's things to learn from them. Because there were things they got right, there were things they didn't get right. So we can learn some tremendous things about this. So the first step in, in receiving God's promises and in walking in the victory that he created us to walk in is to know the promise. Can we agree? 
You can't believe something you don't know. Therefore, you can't receive it. So it always starts with knowledge. You have to know the promise. You have to know what God's word says before you can receive it. So God is very clear about telling us what our promises are. He's so excited about it that he wrote a book. <laughs> right? He made it very clear that he wanted us to know what his promises were. So he wrote them down for time and eternity so everyone would know what his promises are. So, so if you read in Exodus 3, 16 through 17, this is right after the burning bush. Right? And, 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 and Moses has this encounter with God. And he tells him about going into the promised land. And then he says this, Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what, you have been, what has been done to you in Egypt. And then it says, And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he says, I have promised you, right? So he's, he's saying, I've already made the promise. So doesn't that mean it had to exist before then? If he says, I have? Well, if you want to go back to the original promise, it was made to Abraham, Abraham in Genesis 15, 18, the Lord said this, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants, someday if you're good, I will give you. What does it say in your notes? I have given you this land. From the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. So he is, he's, he's telling us, I have already given you the land. Now this is really important to understand because God's promises are always based on an accomplished fact. They're based on an accomplished fact. He's telling them, I have given you the land. Right? Because you can't have faith for something, you can't have belief in something that hasn't already been accomplished. Right? So he gives them, he tells them, it's your land. It's your land. There's no other questions about it. It's just your land. Just go possess it. But God's promises are always based on a past tense accomplishment. Right? He'd already given them the land. And the same thing is true of us. When you read the New Testament over and over and over again, you see, I have. I have made you. Right? I have delivered you. Everything is past tense because it happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. Right? It's a past tense accomplishment. So we just see the same thing with them. He told them the promise. Now, is there any question in anybody's mind about what God's will is for the children of Israel? Do we, are we all in agreement His will was for them to go into the promised land? Is there any question? I mean, th this should be zeroed out. Right? God has made it very clear that He wants them to go into the promised land because He never intended for them to live in darkness. They were made for the light. They are children of light. But see, here's the thing. They had to believe what God said. And they had to believe what God said even when the things around them did not agree with what he said. See, that's the challenge. They had to believe that God's word was true when there was no physical evidence. So belief is trusting in God's word. And they were going to need to believe God's word because they were not going to waltz into the promised land without a fight. So who is it that would want to keep them out of the promised land? Satan. Right? He's the one who brought destruction. He guards over what he does very carefully. He does not want them to experience abundance. Right? He wants them to experience destruction. It's his plan. It's, all, it's his nature. It's all he ever does. And he'll do anything to keep God's people from experiencing it. So the next thing they had to do, and here's one of the keys. We have to understand this. If, if what God 
intended came automatically, whether you did something or not, would there ever be a choice for you? There would never be a choice. It would just fall upon you like ripe cherries from a tree. But is that what you see? See, even in, the, in this story, so look in your notes, Deuteronomy 8.1. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised an oath to your ancestors. So is that conditional? The promise is conditional. Right? So if, if the condition of you entering in was that you were going to obey him, doesn't that mean that you could not go in if you disobey him? It's really clear, right? He's telling us that I have given you the land, but what you do will determine whether you enter in or not. So it's not God's controlling this situation, right? Why is that? He gave us a free will, right? You can't have control and free will at the same time. It's, it's not, they're diametrically opposed. They're diametrically opposed. It's really important for us to understand that. So they have to believe the promise and then they have to act upon the promise, right? So we've talked about this before. Belief is trusting in the word. Faith is acting on the word. Faith is acting on the word. So what, what the Bible is telling us is for these people to receive the promise that God had already given them, they had to believe the word and act upon the word. But we have to understand God's plan because even though God's plan was guaranteed, they had a part to play. They had a part to play, even though it was already done. But see, here's one of the, here's one of the biggest challenges for them, and it's still a challenge for us today, is they did not understand their enemy. See, they thought that the enemy was the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, right? And he thought that the weapons that would keep them out of the land would be swords and spears and chariots. But that's not what kept them out of the land. Because the enemy is not physical, right? We're not fighting a physical war, we're fighting a spiritual war. And what kept them out of the promised land was deception. What kept them out of the promised land was doubt. Whose weapons are those? That's, those are Satan's weapons, right? So here they are thinking they're fighting a physical battle and they don't realize they're being assaulted and because they didn't realize the battle and the enemy, they could not receive God's promises. So they're looking at physical things and they don't understand that what the enemy is doing he's trying to get them to doubt God's word right and it says in both the old and new testament that what keeps you from receiving from him is doubt right because doubt is to waver between two opinions right so they have been given an opinion they've been given a word right from the lord that said it's your land all they had to do was stay with that one word. All they had to do was stay with that one word. And then whatever God said, just do it. Like Nike says, just do it. That's all they had to do. But see, the enemy doesn't want you to go in, so he gives you another word. See, so what he wants to do is he wants to take what God says is an accomplished fact, and he wants to convince you that it's a battle that's to be determined. Did you get that? He wants to take something that God has already said is an accomplished fact, and he wants to convince you that it's to be determined. Maybe you'll get it, maybe you won't. And what he wants you to do is he wants you to consider what you see in the natural and challenge what God said is already real in the spiritual. 
This is how it worked. This is what happened to them. See, we've talked about this recently, how, how the enemy wants us to use our five natural tools to keep us from receiving spiritual promises. So this is what happened as they went into the promised land. See, God had created a system of belief that said, do this, believe this, and it's yours. But see, then the enemy came in and began to create a different belief system. Right? And now there was a choice. Right? Now there's two opinions. And what happens when there's two opinions? Doubt. And the Bible says you can't receive if you doubt. So in Numbers 13, 26 to 29, this is the response of, of the 12 spies. It says, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them, to the whole assembly, and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us. And it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. Now, if that's all they ever focused on, wasn't that what God said? That's the promise right there, right? All they had to do was state, that's the word of God, right? I've given you my word. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's yours. That's all you got to do. Just know that. Just believe that. Just, just, just focus on that. But what's the next word? Mmm, but. Watch where you put your butt. <laughs> right? Because what they were saying is, I know that's what you said, God, but. So now think about this. So they enter into the promised land. Right? You got two guys that they're just steadfast on the word. Right? They're just steadfast on the word. There's a promise that says, this is my land. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. This is my land. And there's nobody that could convince them. Right? But do you believe when they went in, there was an opposition trying to convince them otherwise? Absolutely there was. Was he there in the physical? No. But does he have influence through what he says? See, so he, would, he was going along on the journey with them. Right? And he would try to say things. And Joshua and Caleb would probably say, It is written. Right? Every time they would say something to oppose God's word, they would just say, It is written. This is my land. But think about this. So they, they enter into the promised land and they get to the place where they have this fortified city. Right? And Joshua and Caleb are like, Whatever. I love that city. That's going to be my city. Right? But what does the enemy do? Hey, wait a minute. I want you to think about this now. If this was an accomplished fact and the victory is already won, would that wall still be there? Hmm. Right? And they began to doubt. And then it says that there were Canaanites and Amorites in different parts of the land. Right? So as they came across these lands with these people in it, then the enemy began to say, no, wait a minute. If the victory was already won, would they still be here? And then they got to the place where the giants were. And, and the enemy says, whoa, do you really feel like you could take them out? Feel. How would you feel if you stood next to them? Wouldn't you feel like a grasshopper? Isn't that what the Bible says? Wouldn't you feel like a grasshopper? So what was the enemy doing? He's, he was getting them to use their eyes, their ears, their feelings to doubt God's word. Sound familiar? Same tactic still today. Right? That's exactly what he does. You have been, but look at how I feel. Look at what people say. Same tactic. Doubt 
unbelief. Those are the things that keep us from receiving the promises. See, Satan's job is to create a system of belief that opposes God's. And that's exactly what he's done. Right? And that's why we always say, if you want to know what God says, look at the culture, take what they're saying, and flip it 180 degrees, and that's what God is saying. The problem is, though, what, what both are saying is establishing systems of belief. We have to understand that. If there's a purpose to everything that is said, whether it's God or the culture. It's to create a system of belief because of how God designed us. He created us so that if we hear something enough, we begin to believe it. Right? It's true. If we believe, if we hear something enough, we begin to believe it. And then, if you say it, you receive it. That's how God designed us to work. Whatever you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth is what you have. We could argue about that. You could debate it. It's all over scripture. Right? It, just, just take a moment sometime and look up mouth, lips, tongue, and words. And there are thousands of references. Even though people teach that God is the one choosing Everywhere, it's about you, 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 your belief, what you say. It's everywhere in Scripture because that's how God made us. So I want you to think about this. A belief system is based on the nature of its source and only reproduces after its own kind. A belief system is based on the nature of its source and it can only reproduce after its own kind. This is really, really important to understand. Okay, the belief system that the enemy has created can only reproduce destruction. Can we agree with that? What God created can only produce abundance. But see, there's all this confusion now, and now God gets blamed for destruction, and the enemy gets credit for good things. Because we don't understand how God works. Right? God's nature only reproduces good. Period. Right? He is good, and He only produces good. Right? So if what you're experiencing is, is good, it's God. If what you're experiencing is not good, not God. It should be simple. Right? It should be really, really simple. Right? Jesus made it so clear. He said, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. Is that a, is that a, a statement that a child can understand? And then he says, I have come so that you might have an abundant life. This should be really clear. But that's not what you hear. Nobody knows who's doing what anymore. Nobody knows who's behind anything anymore. Everything's up for grabs. I mean, it could be, we're not, we're not sure. But boy, how can, you, how can you believe someone you don't trust? How can you believe something, someone you don't trust? You have to know what God is doing, and you have to know what Satan is doing. It's the only way you'll have faith to believe him. See, the battle is for your heart because the heart is the source of what you believe. So when the Bible talks about your heart, you know it's not talking about a blood pump. He's not talking about boom, 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 boom. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about your inner you, the real you, your spirit. And that is where your belief system lives. And both of these systems of belief are trying to form that. 
That's why the message is so constant from the enemy, right? Because he's trying to form something in your heart. So listen to what Jesus, this is Jesus' words. This is Luke 6.45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And then it says this, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. This is telling us how it works. Because whatever you say is what you receive. So we need to guard our hearts, right? Proverbs says, guard your heart because out of it flow the issues of life. So the way that you express your belief is through your words. So how does a person make their will known, right? Since we have a free will, how do you express your will? Through your words. Right? If you want something, don't you say something? That's how you express your will. See, and God gave us the free will. We talked about this last week. Express it clearly. And if you're talking to a man, loud and three times. Right? Because we need to hear it multiple times sometimes. But we talked about this. In Proverbs, it says this. You will have to live with the consequences of everything you say. What you say can preserve life or destroy it. So you must accept the consequences of your words. This is all through the Bible. But see, what's shaping our words? Our belief system. So, so here are the words that determined where the children of Israel would end up. Because where they went was not based on what God decided, right? God had already decided for them to go into the promised land. So if God was the one who cho chose and everything happens according to his, his plan, they would have waltzed right in. Am I right? If he was the one choosing, everyone would have entered into the promised land. But see, what happened is they had two viewpoints. You have one group of people that got assaulted by the enemy and began to believe the lie that, hey, wait a minute, this is not an accomplished fact, right? There's giants in the land. I get it, there's big grapes, but there's big giants. I'll take small grapes and small people, right? I'm not going to deal with all that. But listen to the words. This is, this is the determining factor right here. Numbers 13, 33 through 30, 31 through 33. But the men who had gone up with him said, has said, said, this determined it, said. They said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they, they spread among the Israelites a bad report. Some translations say an evil report. Right? What, they, what were they doing? Not only were they confessing a lie, because God had already told them it's theirs, but see, they're confessing what the enemy had said. And not only now were they not going to experience it, they were creating unbelief in everyone else. Right? All the other people that did not go with them could have said, I, I want to stand with Joshua and Caleb. But who do they stand with? The unbelievers. <laughs> They stood with the unbelievers. So it says, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites an evil report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the uh, Nephilims there, the descendants of Anak, who came from Nephilim. Those are the giants. And we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. So they determined, without even talking to them, we must really look like grasshoppers to you, huh? Right? <laughs> Where's that stuff come from? That's not from God. 
But now, listen to the words of life. This is Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb. Numbers 14, 5 through 9. Who were, who were among those who explored the land. They tore their clothes when they heard th their unbelief. They tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we possessed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Now listen, this is wise counsel. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. So now we have to ask ourselves, Who entered into the promised land and who did not? And who decided? See, everyone had the same promise from God. Am I right? Everyone had the same promise. But the ones who believed God's word and did what he said entered into the promised land. The ones who exercised their will and said we can't enter into the land, did not enter in. They did not enter in. So now let's read Numbers 14, 1 through 3. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept out loud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So what did they say? We're going to die in the desert. We're going to die in the desert. So the question becomes, who made the choice? See, if God is the one in control, then everybody goes in. Do you understand what I'm saying? And if he's in control, then what you believe and what you say really has no bearing. He's just going to do what he's going to do. So let's read Numbers 14, 21 through 25. And I want to show you how the lens you see through changes how you view Scripture. See, because my whole life, I was taught through the lens of God being the one who chose everything. Whatever happens because He chose. When I read this passage, I, I, my view was that God was angry with them because of their disobedience and he kept them out of the promised land, right? Because he's in control. So he chose to not let them go in and he chose to let them die in the desert. And that's what a lot of people think. God chose. So God's bringing destruction. But praise the Lord, he's my father and he's good. But on the back of, in the back of your mind, so now let's read this together. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, no one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the promised land, an oath to their ancestors. No one who treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb had a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land. 
he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amorites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route of the Red Sea. So, God is all-knowing, so he knew what was going to happen. But did he make the choice for them? See, that's huge. It was not him who stopped them from going into the promised land. Who stopped them from going into the promised land? Satan did. And he's the one who's stopping us from receiving God's promises today. And he's still using the same tactics today he did then. Doubt and unbelief and bad theology. It's the same thing. So, here's what we have to understand. From the very beginning, God said, those who obey me will enter in. And those who don't, won't. Isn't that what he said? So he established the guidelines right up front. He didn't like change it right in the middle of the story. Right? He told them right up front, here's the deal. I've given you the land, but remember in Genesis when I gave you a free will and I gave you a choice? I'm not going to make you do this. Right? I've given you the promise, but you have to decide what you want. Right? It doesn't, I can't do, he cannot override our free will. He cannot force us to receive anything from him. If he, if he was going to force us to receive anything from him, wouldn't it be salvation? Right? Doesn't he want everyone to enter into a relationship with him? But it isn't automatic. He gives us a choice because he doesn't want slaves. He wants sons and daughters. See, what determined whether they receive the promise is what they believed. What they believed. But see, the enemy has created a system of belief that produces after its own kind. Right? So, so when, they, when they said what the enemy said, what do, what do they say? We can't enter in. We're going to die. Was that God's word? Can you imagine that? <clears throat> God said, you're going to enter in. Right? If they stay with God's word, his word always produces after its own kind. All they had to do was to agree with what he said and said what he said, and they would have entered into the promised land. The ones who believed what he said and said what he said, did they enter into the promised land? The ones who believed him. They entered into the promised land. But see, there was, the enemy had created another system of belief that caused them to say, we are going to die in the desert. We will never enter in. Well, what happened to them? They died in the desert and never entered in. Because they believed a lie. Because they believed a lie. And, and Satan is the small G God of this world, and he's full of lies. All he does is lie. See, and, and, and he's convinced us that we don't have a role to play, that God is the one choosing all these different things because he doesn't want us to exercise our belief and faith. He doesn't want us to watch our words. You get what I'm saying? He doesn't want us to watch our words. He wants us to think that words don't matter, right? Because he wants us to continue to live from his belief system that says, God's not good. He made you this way. You're always going to live this way. And he wants you to continue to confess the, 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 the beliefs that he's established in your heart. Because that's what you're going to have. So the, the key to victory for them and for us is simply to take God at his word. 
to take God at his word. See, last week we talked about how God wanted us to have his kind of faith. And his faith was based on his word. Right? So if our faith is in his word, then nothing else matters. Right? If, if, if our faith is in his word, then it doesn't matter what the enemy says. Right? Now you can say, whatever. Right? I, I don't care what you say. This is what the word of God says. Because the same thing is in play today. Right? You'll read something from the Word of God about something He's already made available to you. The enemy will say, well, really? You really think that's true? You think that's an accomplished promise? Well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. You see the strategy? See, that's why the enemy had to take the gospel and take out important parts of it and say, well, no, 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 God's going to choose now. Maybe you won't receive that. Maybe you will. He's determining that, not you. you no, you can't believe that. Right? Eternal life is assured. That's already paid for. Forgiveness of sin. But no, no, you can't see those other benefits are included. Because look at the evidence. It's everywhere. But those are lies. We have to know what the Word says. We have to believe what the Word says. And then we have to act upon the Word. And that is how God intended for us to receive the promises that he sent Jesus to make available to us. All of these promises that Jesus has made available to us are past tense accomplishments. But faith only works based on believing and doing what the word says. It doesn't work on something that may or may not happen. That's not how faith works. So do you see the strategy of the enemy? See how he's twisted everything? See, just, just standing on the word of God is what has the power to set you free. And not trusting anything else, it'll set you free. Knowing the word standing on the word, believing the word, in spite of giants, Canaanites, Jebusites, neighbors that are opposed what you believe. None of those things can matter to us. The only thing that can matter to us is what the word of God says.